Hello and welcome back. Today we're listening to another lecture on section 2.2. This one is on the graphs of functions and we're going to go through several kinds of functions uh, with specific examples um, of, of, of specific families of functions. Um, we're going to look at linear functions, power functions, polynomials, uh, root functions, reciprocal functions, some absolute values, and some greatest integer functions. And we're going to plot lots of these things using functional notation instead of the usual x comma y notation that we've been, we've been using so far. So just to quickly review, a function is a rule that assigns one output to each input. Exactly one output to each input. Okay, so our graphs, as I showed in the last in the last uh, lecture, our graphs will only ever have one height associated to a given input. So we'll only ever have graphs that look like this. We will never have things like branches coming off. We'll never have a loop-de-loop. -loop. We'll never have two portions of the graph that are over top of each other. Because that would mean that for a given input, we would have two heights or two outputs. So all of our examples today will just be a single line sort of from left to right. It might not be connected but it'll be a single line from left to right with no overlapping vertical portions. And also to review functional notation. Usually a function is denoted f of x. So we've got a name, we've got a list of inputs, and the whole of it is the output. And usually there's some rules, so you write f of x equals a rule. And these different kinds of rules that we'll have today, we've got linear rules, we've got power rules, we've got we've got um, we've got radicals. We've got uh, another one is reciprocals. Another one we'll work with today is the absolute value. And another one we've got is we've got this greatest integer function. There's lots and lots and lots of rules. I could keep going in the circle here and, and I would <laughs> I'd have to keep going because there's so many different kinds of rules that we can work with. Uh, these are just the rules that we'll work with today. Okay, so let's just take a quick example. One, linear functions. So I've graphed these things before. Uh, I'll say f of x is 2x minus 1. So this is a linear uh, expression. It's got an x variable raised to the first power, so it's a linear expression. And all it says is to take an input multiply it by 2, subtract 1 from the result. So let's just make a quick table. x is the input, f of x is the output, and so what do we have here? Let's just plug in like 0, we'll plug in negative 1, negative 2, 1 and 2, and see what we get. f of negative 2 is 2 times negative 2 minus 1, which is negative 4 minus 1, negative 5. f of negative 1 is 2 times negative 1 minus 1, which is negative 3. f of 0 is 2 times 0 minus 1, which is negative 1. f of 1 is 2 times 1 minus 1, which is 1. And f of 2 last one on this table here is 2 times 2 minus 1 which is 3. 
something that you'll notice here is that these are always going up by 2. And these are going up by 1. So for every plus 1 here, we have a plus 2 here. That's because this is a slope of plus 2. Plus 2 over plus 1 is 2. That's a nice way to identify a linear function from a table of values if you're not told the exact rule. So let's go ahead and graph these things. Um, it's not too hard here. We've just got five coordinates to plot. We've got 0, negative 1. We've got negative 2, negative 5. Negative 1, negative 3. 1, 1. And 2, 3. So we'll see how straight I plotted those. There we go. There's our, there's our function f. This is a linear function. It, it, it's exactly what you think of when you think of a line. It's just nice and straight there. All linear functions will, will have this sort of pattern to them, right? If you step up your inputs by one each time, you'll see a constant stepping in your outputs each time. That's, that's exactly what defines a linear function. Okay? The next kind of function that we're looking at is power functions. Power functions also go by another name, uh, polynomials. This is something that we've studied. Right? A polynomial looks like um, something like this. f of x equals x cubed minus 2. Uh, let's go with minus 4x. That's a polynomial. And I've lost my zoom, so hold on one second here. back. So, sorry about the internet blip there. Uh, so we were on power functions and polynomials and I was giving this example here of a good example of that. We've got a third degree polynomial here. We've got x to the third power minus 4x. So we can we can graph this just like we've graphed anything before. Uh, we create a list of, of, potential, um, of potential inputs that we want to look at. So x um, and I'm going to go ahead and plug in some ones that I <laughs> some ones that I I might uh, know a little bit about. Um, so negative two and zero, uh, and zero and two. We'll try those, and then we'll go ahead and we'll try something like one, and we'll try negative three, and I will try also three. So I'm going to plug in a few more things here, um, and I'm going to do this rather quickly, but this is just our f of x here, our output. So f of negative 3. Um, sorry, I don't have these things in order necessarily, but uh, I hope you'll forgive me. Um, I'll also plug in negative 1. I, I totally forgot that one. So f of negative 3. You know what? Here we go. We're just going to do this. Negative 1. 0, 1, 2, 3. There we go. We'll put them in order. <laughs> so what we do here is we say, according to our rule, we cube negative 3, which gives us negative 27. Then we subtract 4 times our negative 3, so that's adding 12. So this gives us, uh, let's see, kind of a small number, negative 15, right? Yep, negative 2, f of negative 2 is the cube of negative 2, which is negative 8, minus 4 times negative 2, so plus 8. And there we have 0, f of negative 1. Negative 1 cubed is negative 1, plus 4, that's 4 times negative 1, this is 3. Um, f of 0 is... 0 cubed 
plus 4 times 0, which is 0 again. Uh, you're already seeing a pattern where I, I maybe something that's different, I should say. We're going up by 1 here each time, but this is sort of skipping around erratically. It's going up 15, up 3, down 3. It's really strange, right? Let's keep going. f of 1 is uh, 1 cubed minus 4 times 1. So this is negative 3. Well, that's interesting. f of 2, 2 cubed minus 4 times uh, 4 times 2, which is 8. Back to 0. So now we're skipping around 0, 3, negative 3, 0. And lastly, f of 3 is 27 minus 4 times uh, 3, which is 12, which is positive 15. So there's a nice symmetry here if you look at the way the order of that numbers works. Um, if we just sort of draw a line right here, we change the sign of everything up here and reverse the order and we've got it all down there. So it's kind of a nice little nice little pattern. So let's graph this. This is x cubed minus 4x. I'm going to need 15 here. So I'm going to actually go by 5's. So negative 5, negative 10, negative 15. 5, 10, 15. I hope that's okay. And then on the x-axis, I'm going to go by 1's. So this is negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. 1, 2, 3. Okay, so there's a lot of numbers there, so I'm going to erase some of these. So the x-axis goes by 1's, the y-axis tick marks go by 5. This will this will just make our graphing a little bit easier. And uh, here we go. So we have a few points here. Negative 3 comma negative 15, that's way down here. We've got negative 2, 0. We've got 1, negative 1, 3. Something right about there. 0, 0. 1, negative 3. 2, 0. And 3, 15. So we've got a, a good estimate here for our graph. This is the graph of f and all we've done is we've chosen a bunch of points not quite at random but chosen a bunch of points uh, centered around zero and we've got this nice little curve is this a, is this actually what it looks like well we'd have to plug in a few more points to figure that out right and we'd have to plug all of them in which is impossible to figure that out for real but if we wanted to figure out what it looks like in this square we've done a pretty good job, right? We could plug in a few more points here and here and here maybe, but this is, a, this is pretty accurate. Um, a pretty accurate graph on this subdomain, if you will. Okay, um, this whole time, you know, I've been, I've just been writing it without explaining it, but again, I'm just showing you exactly where I'm plugging everything in. So this is f of three and I'm just showing you how I'm computing everything. Um, this is a nice way of doing things, a nice way of writing things out, and uh, it helps you, I, I would hope, figure things out like that. Um, there's another kind of power function. Notice this one was third degree. Um, this is an odd degree, and it has a pretty distinctive shape. Okay, it was a positive x cubed. That was the leading term. So we notice that it starts down here in quadrant three, and it ends up here in quadrant one. And it has like this snake-like appearance in between this, this sort of an S curve. Um, if we were to make this x to the fifth, or x to the seventh, or x to any odd power, 
it would have essentially the same shape. It would start down here in quadrant three, it would come up, do a wiggle, and then go up and to the right. How many wiggles it does depends on a couple things. It depends on this degree, and it depends on how many terms are in here and the relationships those terms have with each other. But in general, that leading term determines the overall shape, which in the case of x cubed is exactly what you've got here. In the case of x to the fifth, it's almost exactly like what you've got here. In the case of x to the seventh, it's almost exactly what you've got here, right? It's just you add more wiggles in the middle. But what if our power was even? If our power was even, so even A, instead of going like this, starting down here, ending up here, we would have something that starts up here and ends up here. Remember that even powers get rid of negatives. So when you plug in a negative number, you're given a positive result. That doesn't mean that you will always be given a positive number. This, this doesn't mean that you're always going to be above the x-axis with these even powered uh, functions. You could subtract a number, right, a big number. Um, here's 10. And that would shift this whole thing down 10. And so then you would have negative elements to your graph. But what it does mean is from your base point right here, everything's going to be above that if you've got a positive x to an even power. Right from the vertex, everything is above. If you've got a negative in front of that, everything will be below that vertex. And so this, is, this just gives you the, the common form for even powered functions. They will look like this, which is a parabola. It might be more steep. Right? It might be really steep, depending on how big that power is. But they all look like this. They roughly look like a u or an n if the coefficient in front of that power, uh, the, the term is negative. Okay. All right, the next kind of function that we're going to be looking at is a root function. These ones you need to be careful with, because if I gave you something like this, right, y equals square root of x, there's no issue there, right? But if I give you this, and say graph it, the first thing you'd probably do is square root both sides, y equals square root of x, and you would have to have that plus or minus there. If this is a function, this is not, although they have roughly the same form. And the issue is right there, that plus or minus, that gives you two possible outputs for any given input. And so that's, that's the issue here. Um, but for now, we're just going to go ahead and graph some roots. Um, so first, I'm going to go with an even root. This is a square root. And so we'll just quickly make a table. And I'm going to make this one horizontal this time to save some space. And I'm only going to use the numbers that we know. Square root of 0 is 0. Square root of f 1. <laughs> <laughs> is 1. Square root of 4 is 2. Square root of 16, I skipped 9 there, is 3. 4, excuse me. Whew, what's going on here? And we'll go ahead and plot these. You'll notice that I can't plug in negative numbers, so there's not going to be any graph over here. There's going to be nothing over there. Okay. So we're only going to have positive inputs for this or zero. 
When I plug in zero, I get zero. When I plug in one, I get one. When I plug in four, four, I get two. When I plug in the big number 16, five, six, seven, eight, nine, three, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, I'm only up at a height of four. So this curve kind of flattens out. And this is going to be the case for any root function that has an even power, or an even root, I should say. Right, this is the same as x to the 1 half. So long as that is even, the denominator is even, you're going to have a graph that looks something like this. It might be shifted over, it might be shifted down, but it's going to roughly look like this, if that's an even number. What if it's an odd root? Let's go with the third root of x now. And I'll go ahead and make a table, plugging in only the roots which I know the perfect third roots of, or the numbers I know the perfect third roots of. I'll start with 0. That's 0. Negative 1. It's negative 1. Right? Negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. Okay? 8. What's the third root of 8? It's 2. Negative 8. The third root of negative 8 is negative 2. And I could keep going, but numbers are going to start getting too big for us here. So here's our graph. 0, 0. Negative 1, negative 1. I skipped 1, 1. So it, it almost looks like there's going to be a line here, but we're not quite finished. 2 was obtained from getting an eight, plugging an 8 in. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. When I plugged in 8, I get a 2 out. When I plugged in negative 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, I got a negative 2 out. So this graph looks like this. Okay, and this is the way that odd denominators in root functions look. If they were even, they were just one half of this thing, essentially. Evens looked like this, but odds always have this S curve to them. They always have this. So they look like this. Okay. The next kind of function is a reciprocal function. With these ones, you're going to have some sort of rule that looks like this: one over x to some power. And that positive, or that power, I'm going to say it must be a positive number because if it's negative here, it's really just a, it's not a reciprocal function. So what do these things look like and what do we need to be careful of? Well, of course, x can't be 0. If we plug in 0, we get, we get something that's a big problem. So let's go ahead and just take an example of these and look at sort of the general case. Um, let's go with 1 over just x. And then I'll also plot 1 over x squared and 1 over x cubed, and 1 over x to the fourth, all on the same thing, just to give us a good idea. So I've got four functions here. So this is f1, f2, f3, and f4. So here we go. x, f1, f2 is right here. F3, it's right here. F4 is right there. This is a big old table. So here we go. Um, we'll remember that these are just F, 
whatever this number is here of x is 1 over x to that number. Okay, so f1 is 1 over x to the first. f2 is 1 over x squared. So let's plug in some numbers. We'll start with negative 3. We'll plug in negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. We're just going to get a big table. and We're going to plot them all. So here we go. The easy ones, right? 0 is question mark. We have no idea. 1. Well, these are all 1 over 1, 1 over 1 squared, 1 over 1 cubed, 1 over 1 to the fourth. So these are all 1's. Uh, 2. 1 over 2. 1 over 2 squared. 1 over 2 cubed. 1 over 2 to the fourth. 3. It's 1 over 3 to the first. 1 over 3 squared. 1 over 3. I think you get the idea here. This is just becoming more and more ridiculous. Right? Negative 1. So this one is 1 over negative 1 to the first power, which is negative 1. 1 over 1 to the second power gets rid of that negative sign. So this is positive 1. 1 over negative 1 cubed, the negative sign remains, so this is negative 1. And then when we take something to the fourth power, the negative sign is removed. We're starting to see some differences. Negative 2. This is 1 over negative 2, so it's negative 1 half. 1 over negative 2 squared is 1 over positive 4. 1 over negative 2 cubed, the negative sign, um, the negative sign remains, so this is 1 over or negative 1 over 8. Negative 2 to the fourth, the negative sign is removed. It's 1 over 16. We're, we're, we're going to see this, that we have the same numbers over here as we do over here, but the signs are changed if the power is odd. Okay, so we know what this is. This is negative 1 third. We know what this is. This is positive 1 ninth. This is negative 1 27th. This is positive 1 81st. Okay, so now I know it's a bit confusing here. There's a lot of numbers flying around. We're going to go ahead and start plotting things. So I'm going to plot all of these numbers in red. And I'll graph those first. range here. Nothing got bigger than 1 or smaller than negative 1. So I'm going to say this is 1, this is 1, negative 1, and we've got negative 1 half here, negative 1 half, negative a fourth, negative a fourth. We can, sign up, we can kind of see these things sort of uh, in that way. And then I never plugged anything in that was bigger or smaller than 3 or negative 3. So there's negative 1, negative 2. Here's 1 and 2. Here we go. So in red, we had negative 1, negative 1, negative 2, negative 1 half, negative 3, negative 1 third. So that was, again, negative 1, negative 1 negative 1, negative 1 half, negative 1, negative 1 third, which I'll assume is something like this. Negative 1 third, maybe it's about that. We don't know what to do for 0. At 1, we had 1. At 1, at 2, we had 1 half, positive, and at 3, we had positive 1 third. So we see that this graph looks something like this. but we don't know what happens here. It looks like 
looks like it's going to get close to something. And I'll just I'll fill in the blanks. What happens is this just gets closer and closer there to the y-axis, and this does the same thing. And it just goes up faster and faster the closer you get to it. So that is 1 over x to the first. The next one we had was 1 over x squared, which I'll plot in blue. Uh, when we plugged in 1, we still got 1. When we plugged in negative 1, we got 1 as well. When we plugged in 2, we got 1 fourth. When we plugged in negative 2, we got positive 1 fourth again. We can go back up and look, but here it is. Everything's positive. 1, 1, 1 fourth, 1 fourth, 1 ninth, 1 ninth. So at 3 and negative 3, we got 1 ninth, which I'll assume is something like this. About 1 ninth is right there. So these things make a graph that looks something like that. Everything's above the x-axis, right? So it's a different shape. Okay, let's let's graph one over x cubed in maybe green. Here we plugged in one and we still got one. We plugged in negative one and we got negative one. When we plugged in two, we got one eighth. When we plugged in negative two, we got negative one eighth. When we plugged in 3, we got 1 27th, really close to the x-axis, and negative 1 27th here. So this guy, it's really steep. And it gets really close to the x-axis really fast. But it looks like the 1 over x, right? It's got one piece down here. And the other piece up here. That's very different from the 1 over x squared. And now we'll, we'll look at 1 over x to the fourth in brown, and you'll, you'll recognize it right away. We had 1 and 1 for plugging in 1 and negative 1. We had 1 16th when we plugged in 2 and negative 2. And we had 1 81st. It's basically right on the x-axis when we plugged in 3 or negative 3. So this thing is steep. Looks like this. It doesn't curl back. It keeps going like that. But that looks just like the blue one. It's steeper, but it looks just like the blue one with a piece in quadrant 1 and a piece in quadrant 2. So these, these uh, reciprocal functions, just like the just like the power functions and, and root functions, you know, they've got specific specific characteristic shapes depending on the evenness of depending on the parity, I guess, of the of the power there. The even powers, you know, look like look like they're gonna make a mountain as the graphs approach each other. Or if they were negative, uh, we would have like a, a deep valley they would be creating. Whereas the odd powers give us this, this opposing side thing, right? We've got something in quadrant one up here and something down in quadrant three. So they're sort of, they're sort of on opposite corners of the, of the plane. So those are good examples of reciprocal functions. Absolute values are our next one. So to graph an absolute value, um, we're just going to, again, make a table. Um, so here we go. Um, let's uh, take a rule that is a little bit different this time. OK, not your basic thing. So it's the absolute value of x minus 2 plus 3. And we'll go ahead and graph this. x, f of x. So here, let's plug in, uh, let's plug in 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. 
and we'll see what we get out. Um, when we plug in zero, we get zero minus two, which is negative two. Absolute value makes it positive. So two plus three is five. One gives us one minus two. which is negative one. The absolute value makes it positive one, plus three gives us four. Two gives us zero in the absolute value. Zero plus three is three. Three gives us three minus two, which is positive one. Absolute value keeps it positive one, plus three is four. And when we plug in four, we're gonna get two in there, plus three is five. We get this nice thing happening where it's coming down and then it's coming back up. That's exactly what the absolute value graph looks like. Okay, If I were to tell you just the graph of the absolute value of x, it would look like this, a v. That's the absolute value of x. Our graph is a little bit different. When we plug in 2, one, two, we get a height of three. One, two, three. And I need more space. Four, five. When we plugged in two, we got a height of three. So let me do this in another color. Two and three. Um, that graph should not coincide with this one. All right. So this is supposed to be at a height of two here, and this is supposed to be at a height of three there. Okay. Oops. So height of three. I'll try my best right there. All right. That is what we get when we plug in two. We have a height of three. Um, when we plugged in one and three, we actually got a height of four. So here and here. When we plugged in zero, we got a height of five. And when we plugged in four, we got a height of five. So this graph, quite similar, has the exact same shape. It's just been shifted to the right two and shifted up three. And that should uh, correspond exactly to what happened in the rule of a function. We took this original one, we subtracted internally two. That shifts the whole thing over two units. And then sort of externally, we added three, and that actually shifts the whole thing up three. So we subtracted two from the x's, shifted it to the right, and then we added three to the whole thing, and that shifts it up. This is what absolute value graphs look like. They look like a V. So if you do a couple of these, um, by just plotting some points that you've calculated from the rule. It's going to be pretty quick. You'll figure that out um, real quick. OK, and the last kind of function that we've got is something called the greatest integer function. OK, the greatest integer function. Um, the symbol that your book uses for this is this. Um, sometimes it goes with uh, this notation. Okay, but the big idea here is that this is the biggest, biggest two G's one G. That's embarrassing. Biggest integer less than or e uh, just less than um, x. Uh, actually.
Actually, I think it is equal to, less than or equal to. So the input. Okay, it's the biggest integer less than or equal to the input. So um, here we go. Let's make a table. And we'll look at what this looks like. All right, so <clears throat> negative 3, negative 2, negative 1. I'm leaving space on purpose here. Um, 0, 1, and we're going to need some more things here eventually. So here we go. And plot these points as we go. 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3. All right. What is the biggest integer less than or equal to negative 3? It's obviously negative 3. What is the biggest integer less than or equal to negative 2? OK, negative 2. So these things are all like this. They're, they're all themselves. What about this one? Negative 2 and a half. What's the biggest integer less than or equal to negative 2 and a half? Well, it's still negative 3. That's not going to change until this input becomes negative 2, in which case it will jump up to negative 2. How about negative 1.1? What's the biggest integer less than or equal to negative 1.1? It's negative 2. Right, that doesn't change until our input becomes negative 1 when it jumps up then to negative 1. So I could do negative 0.75, and we know this is still negative 1. We could do 0.2, and this is still 0. 0 is less than or equal to 0.2, and it's the biggest integer that is still less than or equal to 0.2. So at first, we had this, this almost linear thing, ha well, yeah, this linear thing happening. where all of our points, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, we had this thing going on, right? But when we plotted more points, and this is a good thing to, to see and understand, is when you plot more points, you might uncover things that you weren't expecting, right? So when we plugged in negative 2.5, for example, we didn't get negative 2.5. We got negative 3. And then we sort of thought about it, and we realized that doesn't change until you get to negative 2. Right? And then it jumps up to negative 2. And then it doesn't change from that until you get to negative 1. Right? We plugged in negative 1.1 there, and we still got a height of negative 2, because that's the biggest integer still less than negative 1.1. And so this greatest integer function has this cool looking graph that looks like a staircase. There's closed circles on each left endpoint because at that input, the biggest integer less than or equal to it is itself. But on the right endpoint, we're at the next integer for the input. So the biggest integer less than or equal to that input is itself. So it's closed here. Sorry, open here, but it's oh, it's closed up there because it jumps up at that very point. Okay, so these are this is again called the greatest integer function. Um, sometimes it's called the floor function. Floor function. Basically, it just means round it down. Okay, so uh, it can also be called a truncation function. But if you plug in any decimal, number, so zero point one five two blah blah blah, negative one point six two blah blah blah. When you take the greatest integer function of those inputs. 
the end result is always just round it down. So this rounds down to zero. This rounds down to negative two. Okay, you're just rounding to the next smallest integer. And that's why when you plug in something that is an integer, there's no rounding that needs to happen. That's just negative two, right? Rounding one down to the next integer does not. Okay. So uh, in this lecture, you saw how to graph lots of different kinds of functions. And all of these things were functions. Um, so let me real quickly give you a rule, a test, a test to see if something that you're given is or is not a function. It's called the vertical line test. Vertical line test. So if you take any graph and you just start thinking of vertical lines placed over top of that graph everywhere, right? So here's, here's a random graph that I'll draw. Okay, we're just gonna start thinking of vertical lines sort of everywhere along it. Now these are all vertical lines. I didn't draw all of them. There's lots more we could draw, but any vertical line. Just start thinking of any vertical line. And in particular, you're going to look for a vertical line which, which has a certain property. It's going to intersect multiple times. So the vertical line test says is, the vertical line test says if any vertical line intersects the graph of the proposed function, right? Someone says, hey, I think this is a function. And you're like, uh, let me look at this vertical line here. If that vertical line intersects the graph of the proposed function in more than one place, The graph is not a function. It is not the graph of a function. Perhaps it better say. What this means is I looked at that, I drew that graph there, uh, and I look at this vertical line here, and it, inter it intersects in three places one, two, three. Right? So that graph that I drew is not the graph of the function. Uh, there's some other things that are very common that are not functions. A circle, for example, it's not a function. Not a function at all. Uh, what I drew earlier, the square root, is a function. But if I include its negative side as well, this is the same as a parabola flipped over, it's not a function. Okay. Uh, these are very common examples, right? So the vertical line test is, is kind of a powerful thing if you're given the graph. It, it's not as powerful if you don't have the graph, obviously. So how can you see this in data? Well, in data, what you're looking for is essentially what you're plotting. In data, the vertical line test looks like this. So I'm going to list x's here and I'm going to list outputs here. Okay, now you can imagine you've got a big spreadsheet of, t of tables uh, of, I don't know, income and dates and paychecks and I don't know, whatever else you might do or include in a giant spreadsheet for an accounting thing uh, or maybe just your personal budget or whatever. But let's say Let's say uh, you've got the specific time here. So this is exactly noon. 
on on today and you you look in your wallet and you're like I've got five bucks and then at 1 p.m. you know you've listed and you've got six bucks and you're like woohoo I found a dollar on the road or something I don't know and you keep listing all these dates but but later on you also write noon and now we're at three dollars at noon and there's more dates of course or more times of course but these are all in the same day so in real world data you would actually do things like this right for a company or for your own personal budgeting you would list possibly dates right or times and you would keep track of values that are associated to those dates and times like how much you paid an employee or how much money you had at a certain time if in a table like this you see the same time associated with different amounts that doesn't make any sense right it doesn't make any sense you you can't have five dollars and three dollars at the exact same time on the exact same day that's impossible so this is the vertical line test in a table of data if you have the same input but get different outputs that that violates the definition of a function so with that we're all done with this section on 2.2 and graphs of functions um, we we looked at lots of different kinds of graphs lots of different kinds of functions and we looked at this final test which can help you uh, determine if something is a function or is not both graphically and uh, from a set of data I hope that helps uh, and good luck with your homework and I will see you next time until then